Naming a car company after yourself is fine if you're called Ferrari or Pagani or Lamborghini or even Morgan. It's not such a good idea if your last name is something stupid like Shufflebottom or Death. Unfortunately, this is advice that was ignored by a German man called Roland Gumpert. And here is the result. The Gumpert Apollo S. However, despite the stupid name, when this strange-looking car came to our test track, it lapped quicker than anything, including the original Veyron. But then that's not entirely surprising when you learn that it's basically a racing car with headlights and a twin-turbo Audi V8 that in basic tune makes 650 horsepower. That's enough for 0 to 60 in less than three seconds and a top speed of 200 and 23. Better yet, there's the option to tweak it up to 800 horsepower. And plans are afoot to launch a version with a thousand horsepower. So that's the Gumpet Apollo. Silly name, serious car. There's a famous scene from the first Gulf War when a convoy of Humvees enters a minefield. One of them hits a mine, gets blown clean in the air, lands on all four wheels, and continues on. That is not possible in a Land Rover. It was at this moment that the Hummer legend was born. And someone quickly figured out that there were enough crazed gym enthusiasts in California to justify making the Humvee available to non-military types. Fitting the Humvee into civvies meant replacing the 6.5-litre Detroit diesel engine with a 6.6-litre GM Duramax. And since this engine made just 300 horsepower in a car that weighs more than most houses, it was often quicker to walk to the shops than use the Hummer. Still, if between you and the shops was a 22-inch obstacle to be cleared, or a puddle 30 inches deep, or a minefield, the Hummer H1 was the car for you. These turned out to be obstacles that most people don't face, and as a result, the H1 Alpha was discontinued after just over a year. The Koenigsegg CCX holds a special place in Top Gear history. For a long time, it was the fastest car around our track. To this day, it has the longest name of any car on our lap board. And it's the only car the Stig has ever stuffed. Stig's accident wasn't small, but then it wouldn't be with a 900 horsepower, twin supercharged, four and a half litre V8 pushing him towards the tire wall. But in a straight line, that power also means speed. 245 miles an hour to be exact, and that's not far off what a Veyron can do. Except, of course, a Veyron has a huge wing on it as standard, and a Koenigsegg, as Stig found out, does not. Or at least it didn't until Stiggy's accident, after which it became an option for any owner who didn't fancy ruining the inside of their underpants. Even someone as fast and as brave as Stig would be wise to choose it. If you think the Lamborghini Murcielago isn't rare or special enough, this is the car for you. It's called the Rebenton. And if you think it looks like an F-22 Raptor stealth fighter, you'd be right. That was the idea. Except on the Raptor, all the strange surfaces and matte black paint are meant to make it look more discreet. But this car is a Lamborghini and Lamborghini doesn't know the meaning of discreet. Certainly, there's nothing even remotely discreet about the monstrous 6.5-litre, 640-horsepower V12. Firing that up is like strapping a unicorn to the roof and driving around shouting, Look at me! through a loud hailer. Mind you, frankly, you've more chance of seeing a unicorn than seeing a Rebenton because Lamborghini made just 20 of them. Although if you do see one, you'll almost certainly remember it. This is a Lexus. 
I know, doesn't look like one, does it? It doesn't sound like a Lexus from the details, either. I mean, it has a 4.8-litre, 552-brake-horsepower V10. It also has a carbon fibre body. And it does 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds and has a top speed of 200 miles an hour. This is what happens when you tell Lexus engineers to stop making quiet, dull saloons for people who play golf. Let off the leash, they go mad and make this, the LFA. A car that sounds like an F1 racer and goes like a Ferrari 458, as it should when you discover that it costs twice as much. But just to prove they haven't forgotten their insane attention to detail, the Lexus boffins have given it dashboard vents that gently waft from side to side to make sure the air is evenly distributed around the cabin. This is a Lexus in the same sense that I'm a 400-meter runner. In other words, it isn't a Lexus at all. What this is is Toyota showing exactly what they're capable of. And it turns out that what they're capable of is quite a lot. Before the Bugatti Veyron, there was this, the 241 mile an hour McLaren F1. Despite its similar top speed, the McLaren F1 is the very opposite of the Veyron. No turbochargers, no four-wheel drive, no traction control, no ABS, and no flappy paddle, electronically controlled gearbox. In spirit, the McLaren is closer to a Caterham than a Bugatti, a Caterham with a gold-plated engine compartment. It was built without compromise, and nothing was to get in the way of the driving experience. That's why the driver sits in the middle, so they feel completely in control. McLaren was so determined to use this layout, they even had the law changed to make it possible. Then there's the 627 brake horsepower, 6.1 litre V12 engine built specially for this car by a crack team of BMW motorsport engineers and the bespoke gearbox and a body made of carbon fibre. We take that for granted in supercars now, but back in the early 90s, it was so extraordinary they might as well have made it from lumps of Jupiter. Personally, I've never cared that much for the F1. It was too twitchy. But without it, Bugatti wouldn't have had something to aim for and we wouldn't have had the incredible Veyron. In that respect, we owe McLaren our thanks. This is the greatest Anglo-German cooperation since, um, ever. It's the Mercedes-Benz SLR McLaren. From Germany, the big badge on the front, and the 5.4-litre supercharged V8 that gives this car 626 horsepower and a top speed of 208 miles an hour. From England comes the grey and silver, barrows in the top pocket, engineering know-how of the McLaren F1 team, who came up with the carbon fibre body and built the whole thing in their Surrey factory. As you might imagine, the marriage between these two companies from these two nations was not easy. Mercedes insisted the SLR had to be front-engined and look exactly like this. McLaren insisted this was not ideal for a supercar. Mercedes wanted a comfortable, well-equipped cruiser. McLaren wanted a hardcore, lightweight racer. The two sides couldn't even agree on what the SLR sounded like at full chat. Mercedes said it was like a Messerschmitt. The British reckoned it was more like a Spitfire. Yet, despite the disagreements, the end result was a very fine car. Monstrously fast and loud when you drove like you'd sat on a bee, yet relaxed and easy to live with when you didn't. The only real problem were the carbon brakes, which worked like a switch. But whatever, the SLR is dead now and the two firms behind it have gone their separate ways. Although strangely, Mercedes now make the SLS, a hardcore cruiser, and McLaren the MP4-12C, a civilised supercar, which is somehow slightly ironic. This is not just the greatest car Mercedes makes. Right now, I think, 
it's the greatest car in the world. It's more powerful than a Ferrari 458, just, it's a little bit louder than a Lamborghini, and it's way more fun than the 911 RS GT Turbo 3S, or whatever this week's Ultimate Beetle is called. This is the thinking men's supercar, the Mercedes SLS. The engine is AMG's own 6.2-litre V8 linked to a flappy paddle double-clutch gearbox that sits at the back for perfect weight distribution, so that it feels as though the entire car pivots around, well, around your bottom. It does a lot of pivoting, if truth be told, because while it can do huge distances in great comfort, what it is at heart is a shouty, snarly, tail-happy, gull-winged lunatic. And that is why I love it. This cross-eyed curiosity is a Morgan Aero Supersports. As with all Morgans, much of the structure is made from wood. And if that sounds laughably old-fashioned, well, it is. It's also still made in the Malvern Hills of England in a factory so caught in the past that when a propeller aircraft passes overhead, half the workforce jumps. Surprisingly, the engine in this car isn't made from mud and leaves. It's actually a BMW V8 that makes a rather modern 368 horsepower, allowing this half-timbered sports car to get from 0 to 60 in four and a half seconds. It'll even run on to 170 miles an hour before its Edwardian aerodynamics prevent it going any faster. I said sports car, but in truth, this is as much a sports car as Westminster Abbey is a top-class rock and roll venue. This isn't a car to compete with modern Jaguars or Mercs or anything beyond. It's a strange time warp for people who believe cars should come with built-in nostalgia and a special kind of hat. And if that hasn't put you off the Aero Super Sports, you should know that there's also a version with a fixed roof, one of which is owned by Richard Hammond. The idiot. The Pagani Zonda, a car which proves that in Italy you can wake up one morning, drink one too many espressos, tell the world you're going to make a car as fast and as good as a Ferrari, and then actually go ahead and do it. This particular version, one of a baffling array of Zondas over the years, is the Cinque, a road-going version of the feral, track-only Zonda R. It's always puzzled us at Top Gear how Pagani makes its cars so good. Yes, they put in the effort by inventing a new cocktail of carbon fibre and titanium called Carbotanium. And they managed to persuade Merck's power-crazed AMG division to build them special V12 engines. But that's not enough on its own. What Pagani really understand is that a supercar should be loud and dramatic and fast enough to make your eyeballs turn to putty. They also make cars that are incredibly easy to drive. Many men in sheds try to make supercars, and they get it wrong. But Pagani, as we see here, consistently gets it right. Very, very right. If you like your racing cars to sound like a god of thunder treading on a drawing pin, you won't like the noise made by this, Peugeot's Le Mans winning 908, because it sounds rather like a vacuum cleaner. And the reason for this is because it runs on diesel. As dreary news goes, though, this isn't as bad as it could be, because the diesel engine in question is a 5.5-litre twin-turbo V12 with 730 horsepower and nearly 900 torques. That is a lot. And it means that even with a wing the size and length of a cocktail bar on the back, it can still reach over 250 miles an hour on the long Le Mans straights. The combination of speed and the fewer pit stops demanded by diesel economy mean Peugeot was a dead cert to win the 24-hour race in 2007. 
Except it didn't, because Audi fetched up with a diesel car that was even faster and even more reliable. The French plan didn't quite work in 2008 either, but by 2009, Peugeot got their act together to take a 1-2 Le Mans finish. Normal service was resumed in 2010. Spiker was a Dutch company that went out of business in 1925, apparently. Don't worry, I didn't know that either. I'd never heard of Spiker, nor its financial troubles, nor even that there was a motor industry in Holland. I'd always assumed they had other industries to be getting on with, like flowers or cheese. But then, a Dutch millionaire got bored with having too much money and bought Spiker back with cars like this, the C8 La Violette LM85. It has a 4.2-litre V8 engine from Audi and a chassis that was developed with help from Lotus. But the really interesting thing about Spikers is the way they look, which is like nothing else, and their interiors, which are like something else, although in most cases that something else is an explosion in one of those shops that sells jewellery and expensive luggage. Spikers' millionaire owner says that's what people want, and presumably he's right. Because when most restarted car companies fail within seven minutes, Spiker is now doing so well, it recently bought Saab. Eventually, all TVRs will break down, and now so has the company that made them. That's a shame. Nothing was a bad idea at TVR. They tried to reinvent the door handle. They made front wings that appear to have been attacked by a mad axeman. They got the company Dog to help with the styling. Obviously, there was no guarantee that your TVR would start of a morning, and even less of a guarantee that once it was going, it wouldn't attempt to fling you into a field of sprouts. But the insanity was just part of what made TVRs so special. Given their inability to make anything work properly, it was yet another example of their madness that they made their own 4-litre straight-six engine. Still, in a car this light, it meant 0-60 in 3.7 seconds and a top speed of 185 miles an hour. TVRs were the snorting, grunting, swivel-eyed lunatics of the car world and were somehow worse off without them. Life.